Don't quote me on anything. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got 20, 25 minutes. Okay, that's more than enough. So thank you everyone for receiving me. Uh, what I'll be talking about this session is focusing on the licensing part of free software. So getting coverage on the licenses that you might find, some of the implications, and some of the tools that we are developing and standards to manage these licenses. In the end, uh, we have a quiz. So prepare your computers and we'll start. A bit about myself. Uh, I began my professional career some time ago in the Army. And people don't really see this as a very good environment for free software or open source, but they might be mistaken, because where I was working we had a very limited budget. We needed to fix computers, but we didn't have the money to buy the licenses for the tools. And some of the things that we were doing there was actually giving a lot of code to the community and working with other people around the world that had similar problems. So this gave birth to tools like WinBuilder and communities like Reboot. I was there for quite some time, then I went to the US to study software engineering. And I also see that people there also have the tradition of sharing their code. It's not really something so unusual. We do something, we give it to our friends, we talk about it, we like to share it. That's the thing we do. After studying, I went to the space agency here in Europe, uh, to Darmstadt, and I began as a trainee looking at software. But quickly what I began doing was actually looking also at how they were using open source and free software. So I became kind of the person in front of their products for the space industry that were applying open source. And some of the things that we see about it is that the growth is really getting very high. But the question is, how high? If you look back 10 years, at least in the space industry, there wasn't so much of an open source. It was a very close environment. You want to control everything. But what I see is that not just you find a very big scale of growth in open source and free software, is that you also find the shrinking part of proprietary portion being each time smaller. In my, I did around 50 analyses of different projects and I can say that around 90% is already free software or open source of some kind. But the best part is that the new projects, they are already 100% in free software or open source. In fact, even ESA is considering a, a new free software license to be used. So these are all small steps, but they kind of matter. However, with the rise of open source and with the good popularity that we find, we also see another problem that is getting bigger. We can't hide it so well. And this is the licenses. I mean, people usually don't care so much about the license because they just want to share their work. They want to give it to someone else. And this is good. But when you're trying to think on a more uh, professional or industrial context where people really want to make free software the, the standard, the mainstream, we, get the, we stumble into the issue of licensing and how things can be used or not. So we see, for example, the case of GitHub, and it grew quite fast. I mean, more than 10 million projects right now. But also at the same time, uh, you can see that the biggest portion doesn't declare what license can be used. And in my opinion, at least, it's kind of a waste, because you look at the, all this code available, and you can't say to people, well, this option might be better than the proprietary one. But they ask me, what's the license? We don't really know. So, we have a very clear challenge. We are trying to do the things that we always did, meaning that we develop some software and we create it, it's ready, and we want to give it to someone else. But at least when you're trying to do it, it's not always so easy. Things don't always go so well. For example, if you're doing free software, one of the things that you might see sometimes is that people complain if you are not really compliant. So we want to try to solve this, because the last thing that you want to see, probably if you're doing software in a professional context, is that it might even go to a court and go to an escalation of things. There is a conflict here. There is not enough transparency or trust. And this is all of a big problem that we would like to at least minimize. Or And how can you actually do that? Communicating to people. So this is one of the challenges that we have in front of us. From what I see in regards to compliance, at least in my experience, what I notice, it gets very easy when it's just an idea. So you still have it in your minds, you still want to see how it goes, we're not doing anything wrong. But as soon as we start to going a bit more on the development phase, it starts to get each time more difficult. All the way up to the top, when you really have to make the software available to someone else, and already starts to be a bit too late to make the changes. So, when we are starting with an idea, I guess most of us in this room knows that the choice of a platform matters. I mean, but even so, it really requires a careful study, a careful choice. Because say if you want to reach a wide stream of people, you want to go to the App Store, 
Well, while using free software, you might not even be adopting it as your license for your own software, but you might be using components underneath it. And there are some restrictions about this. There are some conditions that you need to understand. And the same goes for HTML, which is actually what I recommend for people to use as a standard. But this is just the beginning. Then we get into a more fuzzy slide, the way you see it right here. And things start to get a bit more uh, variables. I mean, you can actually... I want to target my software to be Apache. But if you do so, then you have to be careful about the other licenses that you're adopting. Or if you're having your architectural discussion, I mean, you see a lot of brands and logos and stuff that they have there. But even those things, even if they are under a GPL license, for <coughs> example, their understanding of GPL might be a little bit different from yours. I mean, it's all a bit of a work that starts to increase in terms of compliance, in terms of complexity. Uh, I just keep here the WordPress uh, part of the logo because I find it interesting that they now recommend all the work built upon WordPress to also be GPL, which is a commendable move, but it's still so much of a discussion about it. Then you go for development. In here, I'm actually putting a, a very nice way of how I write my own code, but most importantly, what we usually do when we are in front of a computer is that we are stuck in a problem <laughs> and... Yeah, always good code. And we don't really... Well, if you get stuck, what do you do? You go to the internet, you find a solution, and then you put it in your code. It runs, and it's great. But I mean, from a copyright perspective, it's imagine it like the poem of someone else. You are taking that piece of code and text that someone else wrote, and then you're applying it inside your own text, but you're not really giving much of an attribution. You're not giving a copyright. And if people later use tools to detect these snippets, they might actually not discover where it comes from. Just for some basic information, this is a term that people don't usually talk so much, so often, but in the compliance world, provenance is the art of discovering where the software comes from. So they have people that they usually, when they give a snippet of code, they try to discover where it comes from. They try to see exactly what's the source, so that they can, for example, ask permission for the person to use it. Because many times you see code sharing around the, the world, but you don't really know who was the author. Might be good, might not be good, but we also like to at least from what I see from the people with whom I work, they don't, don't want conflicts, they want to actually ask permission for people. They want to actually make things okay. This is usually for government institutions. And this is also my recommendation, if you're developing code, of a good way of solving this issue. Uh, it's very simple. I'm just putting Java here, but you can put some annotations explaining where the code came from, who was the author that you believe it to be, and the date when you did it. It might not even be the more accurate information, but this is the information you have. This is the place where you took the code from. And it's already a great help, because when you're doing a provenance analysis and you find the same snippet on 30 different projects, I mean, it's just crazy. How can you tell where it came from? And if you're more conservative, you can't even use a snippet. You have to remove it completely. So this is already a very big help. Then we were talking about the curve, if you remember. Now we are getting close to the packaging. And on the packaging, this is the more, I would say it's a more serious portion. All of it is serious, but this one is really the one where you're going to be preparing the software to make available to others. Usually, you try to remove all non-compliant issues that you find. And by non-compliance, I don't mean legal from a point of view. I mean things that we consider a risk of not really being correct. Both from an ethical view, you can name it, but if you find something that you don't like it, then you try to put it with the yellow, try to put it with the red, try to put it with the green. And if you get to this point and you're still finding red dots there, it's not a good thing. And this is a screenshot from a real project. But the more scary stuff is that it's not just one, but there were 500 components in this project. And as you can see, you find a lot of reds already. And these are things on the last stage that you still need to re-engineer to correct. And so imagine how difficult now it gets to tell all these people, to tell all these managers and so on that, well, we can't use this piece of free software because it's not so compliant. Uh, imagine what's their answer. And so it's not so, compli it's not so easy sometimes to get uh, an agreement or get things to be done correctly. But most of the cases it is possible if you work in advance, if you have some experience. And the good thing is that you get your car ready with all the software inside and then can walk out the door and start to be using by people. So this is the good thing about software, is that free software also accelerates things to be developed. And you get your car ready. Hopefully in a year it will be an electrical one. But then 
After your car is released, you go outside of the door and people start to use it. But what you also notice when things start to be used by other people that are not inside the company, for example, they start to ask questions. I mean, where is the compliance in that? A few people know, but nowadays when you buy a car, it's full of software. I'm not kidding about this. And much of it is also free software. But if you notice, even with a cell phone, when you get your own cell phone, you don't really get a, a file or a document saying, well, you have X, Y, Z licenses inside of it. You don't really ask for this information. It's not so available. The only compliance that you see from most of the manufacturers is still a slide like this one, completely white. I mean, you don't see so much. You have to ask questions. So it starts the process of discovery. This is for people that come from Germany. This is actually more or less common. They start to see a lot of hackathons. We start to break apart software compiled or in source and try to see where it comes from. What are the licenses <coughs> applicable? What can you discover about them? And this is not really the best way of doing it because this is one of my analyses, one of my logs, because I have, want to track all the things that I'm doing so that if I'm wrong, someone can correct it. But that's the thing. I can be wrong. I don't know where the code came from. I mean, we are talking about provenance and compliance. And many times I'm just doing assumptions, trying to discover where the code is coming from. And this is not so good. This is not really the correct way of doing things. So to solve these kind of situations, there is actually a nice standard already being proposed. <coughs> It's called SPDX, so the Standard Package Data Exchange. This comes from the Linux Foundation. It's being worked in a way that we can actually use it to describe the licenses. So that when someone is creating a piece of software, they can actually pick on this SPDX format, describe all the licenses. But before one starts to think that it's a very complicated uh, format, I actually include a screenshot of it. It's nothing more than a text file where each line has a meaningful data that anyone can read. There is also the XML version for automated tools, but I'm just putting here the, the version that I prefer to use in my own daily cases. So as you can see, it has information about the, the checksum. It has small information about the file, and already has an information about the license that someone, a human, for example, has been analyzing inside the file. So if you remember before, I was doing the things manually, trying to discover them. This is actually the way that I'm now using to document the licenses inside the, the software. And also a very brave effort by the SPDX group that I noticed is that they set up a reference point. So before, there was no common language to describe the licenses. I mean, if you're using GPL version 2, or if you're using a GPL version 2 or above, or if you're using, for example, any other kind of license that is more popular to find, we were all trying to describe it in different ways. There wasn't really a common uh, vocabulary for describing the languages. So. I would recommend going to their website and taking a look because it's really worth your time. Even if you don't adopt the SPDX, just adopting a, a standard list of license descriptions is already very good and a very good step. And one of the things when you start using uh, SPDX, imagine it a bit like HTML for the web. So SPDX tries to do the same with licensing. Once you have a standard and people start to understand it the same way, we can start to do metrics, we can start to do visualizations about the data. <coughs> We can start, for example, to look at SPDX file and see which files have already been analyzed and which files are still missing to be analyzed. You can, for example, make a list of the copyrights inside a given package. Believe me, this is much better than someone just giving a piece of software to you and say, OK, this is GPL. Uh, and then you ask, but what kind of GPL? So it avoids a lot of miscommunication that exists between the both parts. We really need to know and we want to know what we are using so that we can also pass this information to other people. But all that I'm showing here is things that can be done manually, but we also have a lot of tooling already available. And I'm just putting tooling here that costs nothing, that you can use already. Uh, so for example, on the SPDX org, you already find many tools to use from the command line also to convert spreadsheets into the SPDX format, if that's what you're using. And we also, I'm also listing a, a page online that you can also go and try to make an SPDX package out of it. The only downturn is that it accepts only small files because it's uploading things to their server. On triple check, we are also making an SPDX file available. Um, it's actually something that we are using and keep on improving. So, as a proof of concept, we are actually picking on the React OS project for 2004. This is our compliance project. React OS, you can say, come on. 
three minutes. Okay. So this is what we are actually doing as a proof of concept and picking on their source code. And it's quite big. I mean, it's 18,000 files. I can tell you, for me, when I'm looking for the anal analysis and trying to do it, I try to do it on time, but it still takes my time. So I hope that next year I can show you the good results out of it. In terms of reading, I recommend, for example, going to Grooklaw. This is where you find a lot of discussions about intellectual property, and they try to go for the nitty gritty details about it, recently closed also because of security concerns. If you want to read about compliance in general, and you are developing software, I recommend the Open Source License Compendium. It's very practical. And the good thing is that you have a target license that you're using, and you can actually start learning how it goes. I like it. We're from them. Oh, okay. Well, we're not telecom, we're working with the telecom on this. Perfect. I actually use it. Very good. And so we go to the quiz time. And on a quiz time, I actually invite you guys to go into a compliance session to see how easy or how difficult it is to actually determine the license. And I'm not using any tools, I'm just really using your own whiz and your own capacity to go to the internet and try to find information. So we'll be putting some of the components that you usually cross around every day and we are trying to go the reasons why they are used this way. So the first one is MySQL. Everyone here in this room uses MySQL. But I mean, what are the implications that... No, they don't use MySQL. Postgre, I imagine. But um, there are some implications when people think that MySQL can be used for free software development. Is that they also have a lot of license uh, conditions behind them. And their interpretation of GPL might not really be the one that we usually have. So that's the main difference. And I also have a few more quizzes there, but I don't think we have enough time. But basically, I just really wanted to give you some other examples like Mapfish, where they tried to, for example, they promote it as PSD, and it is indeed, but one of the components is not. And it's commercial. So. Compliance is not really so clear most of the times. They require a lot of analysis and effort. Even though we try to have the licenses all very well defined and logical, the truth is that there are a lot of nuances. And that's my session for today. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here to help. Are there any methods to sign on an SPDX file to, to Ensure to make it in a web of trust. So you, you uh, yes, trust uh, there is a checksum that you can put for the whole package. Okay. It's a SHA1 uh, ash that you can use, and this way it can't change. I mean, people say that it can be broken, but for a file, I think that there are no security issues on that uh, perspective. Yes? Uh, does SPDX also wish to include unofficial licenses like the LAGPL, which is constructed by adding? So my recommendation. Already? It won't work. We should talk about that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been on an ongoing discussion and it's really annoying because I have like a web library if I can't decide which license to use as the LAGPL in this machine. Yeah, I, I know we need one and we need to work on it, but just using the exception from the lesser GPL won't work for various reasons. Hmm. We should talk about it. <laughs> yes? I have some questions. You mentioned your condition that um, basically sniff the sniff code or support the protect from each other that are basically very similar. But if I'm telling you read the convention for copyright and other rights, basically it should be a significant contribution to the author. Um, so did you analyze which license should really apply to such kind of code or meta code? So that's the problem. You said it yourself, a significant amount of code. And what's a significant amount of code? <laughs> I mean, how can we measure it? It can be one line, for example, if it's brilliant, or it can be 50 lines, I don't really know. And I'm actually on the snippets, most of the times you don't find licenses attributed to them. Perhaps a CCA, a common commons, a creative commons. But you don't find the license, you find the people that created that code. So what we try to do is try to get in contact with the person, discover if the person was actually the original author of the code, and if not, we just move on to the person from where he copied, if he remembers, or then we try to see some other strategy. Uh, 
Toulouse pour un niveau pour un niveau qui a fait ça pour autant. But on the other hand, if you start to be very picky on each contribution, and in my two lines of the party, you look at him, so for example, mm -hmm. a lot of people took the him, so from the Linux kernel, but it's well done. Um, but basically, this one is not really GPL because it's just an extraction of it, but it's just a very slight distribution. Exactly. Uh, there are no fixed rules uh, from my perspective. From what I see in real world, we can't really apply a, a fixed rule that fits every case. You really have to see the context. Say, for example, if it's automated co code being output, it's a different situation than a small snippet. Well, thank you for listening.